Hello and welcome everybody to the Coney Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I got a great one for you today is on mastering weight management. This is super mega practical what to say and how to say it podcast. I have got Dr. Taryn Pestalozzi here. Uh, she is residency trained in nutrition. She is uh, she is a joy to talk to. She is super practical and pragmatic, which I really love. She's got great advice for setting up these uh, weight management conversations in a way that actually get results and help us convince pet owners to make the steps they need to make to take care of their pets. Anyway, you are going to probably get some affirmation for things that you do out of this. You are also going to get some tips and tricks for things that you don't do or you or ways to have these conversations that you haven't had. I just, I, I'm really big on this. I love it when we get insights on things that we do a lot of because little tweaks in those behaviors make a huge difference because we do them all the time. And so anyway, this episode is is it's really good and it's really useful. I think you guys are going to really, really like it. I have to say thanks to my friends at Hills Pet Nutrition for making this episode possible ad-free. And I also have to say thanks to them for their Hills Veterinary Academy. Guys, if you have not checked out the Hills Veterinary Academy, it is a uh, fantastic learning platform that Hills is putting out and they are steadily growing and expanding. It is packed full of good stuff for training your team. It's got free race CE in there. It's just, it's, there's there's so much that, that's going on and they're really putting a lot of effort into it. So anyway, if you're not familiar with Hills Veterinary Academy, I'm gonna put a link down in the show notes. You can give it a Google if you wanna go that way, but check it out, go see what they're doing. This is a really just a neat little gift to our profession. So anyway, guys, that's enough of that. Let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Taryn Pestalozzi. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Oh, I am so glad that you're here. I have. I am looking forward to this. So what I wanted to talk to you about today, uh, so when you did your internship, you did your internship at Kansas State and you ran the Healthy Weight Clinic there. And I am seeing, uh, I see a lot of, of very heavy pets. I, I, saw, uh, I saw a cat that was rapidly gaining weight last week and it bothers me. And this is a passion of yours. It's something you have a lot of experience in. I just want to run through a healthy weight campaign with you today and just be like, all right, tighten, let's tighten the bolts uh, down here. And I want to make sure that I'm running a program and then I can carry this out. And I want to get weight off of pets. And so uh, are you okay to run through a case with me and just start sure. to finish and, and get me set for success? That sounds great. Let's do uh, it. Let's do it. I have got a 100 pound female spade chocolate Labrador named Greta. And mm -hmm. so Greta is eight years old and those hips ain't what they used to be. You know, sure not. she's yeah, it's, it's just and I can I can see it. You know, I can see that the muscle mass in her in her back legs is not what it used to be. And her owners are not reporting mobility issues. She's not she her, her gait doesn't appear to be, you know, you don't see her walking going, oh, boy, but mm -hmm. she's eight. And I can see that when I look into my future scope where I look ahead a year sure. or two. And so. This dog is is probably 20 pounds overweight. I, I think she should be, honestly, if I'm really serious, she should probably be a 75 pound lab, you mm -hmm. know, but she's a hundred. Um, I could be okay, I think, if she's 80. I have to see it. You know what I mean? And you go, Yeah, I think 80 is about right. I have to see it. But um, but I I need some help in this. And I think that I can get the owners motivated. I, they love this dog. I think I can make a, a solid pitch for the lack of mobility that's coming down the pipes. And, and I, I want to really push. And so I have not gone into this room yet, but I want you to help me. Like that's how the table is set. Um, Taryn, how do you, how do you treat this case? Where, where's your head at when you're standing outside this door get to the exam room, getting ready to go in? Yeah. So I think the first thing is uh, maybe keeping in mind Maybe these owners haven't come to see you for this problem. They've brought Greta in for her annual exam. Yep, she's in she needs. Yeah. Yep. So uh, it can sometimes take people off guard when you bring up a topic and you get really fixated on that, that they weren't really coming to talk about. So first thing I think is to not forget your primary reason for the appointment. And if you need to schedule a follow-up to actually spend more time talking about the weight loss, do that. Um, but then also 
consider like asking permission to talk about her weight. Be thoughtful with your language. Don't use fat humor. There was a um, a consensus statement that came out of the UK between uh, medical professionals and the human medical side and patients um, from obesity programs that talked about what kind of conversations and language are useful. So some of those tips are coming from that consensus statement. I've sort of extrapolated that to our, our veterinary friends. But um, so just be mindful of that as you go in to have this conversation. Okay. T- talk yeah. to me a little bit about asking permission, right? Give me, give me some, give me some language. I know we've had a lot of yeah. doctors and, and there's a lot of technicians that are coming in and taking a history and they know that I'm going to come in and talk about the weight. And it would be helpful to me if they could open this conversation up. So like, give me, give me an example of what that act, asking permission, I get the concept. What does that sound like? Yeah, I, I would start with an open-ended question, probably. Okay. So asking the client, you know, how do they feel Greta's doing overall? Overall, Do they have um, an idea of where they think her, she is in terms of weight? Do they think she's a healthy weight? Do they have any concerns that she might be over or underweight? And that lets you also assess maybe where they're at with that topic. And then ask them, you know, do you mind if we spend some more time talking about this today? Yeah. I, I think I have some concerns. I really like that question of, of, you know, do you have any concerns about her being over or underweight? And it, cause it feels like a standard sort of form question. And it's not a judgment question. It feels like I'm, I'm taking a history or I'm filling out my form and, and it helps me know really quickly. Uh, do they see it or are they blind to it? And we've, and we've seen, I mean, I literally had a case just like this one, chocolate lab, hundred pounds, and the owners just could not see it. And I was yeah. showing them the body condition chart and they didn't get that. That was rare. That, that definitely happened. I still remember it. Um, they were just like, nope, she looks like a five of nine to <laughs> us. And I'm just going, I, we're yeah. not looking at the same things. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, great question. All right. I love it, Taryn. That, that's super helpful. All right. Great. So I get in, get this conversation, get permission to, to, to talk to them about it. I, I, I like it. Mm-hmm. We're, so let's say that they're like, sure, you know, we're here for the, we're here for our annual exam and wellness. Yep. We'll, we'll totally talk about it. Where do, where do you start to go from there? Uh, next, I would, as part of my exam, I do a body condition score um, assessment on Greta. And um, I think most of us are familiar with the body condition score concept. There's a couple different scale systems out there. So there's a five point scale, there's a nine point scale. In the nutrition world, we tend to go with that nine point scale. And if you need a resource in your clinic, the World's Monoblet Vet Association has some nice non branded charts that you can use, but there's lots of them available. Um, and I keep a copy in my exam room, like laminated, and I actually pull it out and I look at it while I do my body condition score, because the more you actually read through the definitions of what each of the points on the scale mean, the more consistent you will get. Mm-hmm. And also, if you have your support staff and the other clinicians in your hospital all using that same tool and actually looking at it, you're going to be more consistent across your whole clinic so that you start building a more reliable history as yeah. you're seeing patients. Okay. I tend to run into not opposition to this conversation, but um, just just a level of passiveness that you know, they don't argue with you. They're not like, no, yeah. we're, we're, we're not going to do a weight loss program. But non-committal, I think, is how I would is how I would yeah. put it. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to lean into, I'm going to lean into the hips in this, in this case and try mm-hmm. to make a, a, a real quality of life point here. But um, as I try to motivate for action and try to push through that non-committal place to, to get them on board with taking action, how, how, how can you support me there? How do you, how do you, yeah. how do you do that? I think it's common for a lot of us to maybe focus on those negative outcomes, right? That we are sort of foreseeing in the future. Um, And there's certainly clients that might need that, right? They maybe need you to really kind of um, hone in on those negative potential outcomes because they might not budge without it. Mm -hmm. But going back to that consensus statement in human medicine, it's actually more effective a lot of times to focus on positive outcomes of weight loss rather than the negative potential um, consequences of being overweight or obese. So I hear from clients all the time, even with minimal, pretty small amounts of weight loss, they're acting so much younger. I can see they look thinner. I'm getting compliments on, you know, how they look. I've had to uh, make their harness smaller. And so really focusing on what the the benefits are and what they might see as that progress happens, I think is often more motivating. I like that. So, so what you were, you're, 
counsel here would be in the case of a dog that's overweight and, and a senior pet is maybe don't, ooh, she's getting older, uh, but, but instead talk about what we could accomplish and like she could yeah, have the best great. years of her life. I mean, there, there's exactly. quite possible we can, we could turn back the wheel of time a couple of years yeah. and you would, let's, you would see her. Sure. Let's give her, you know, the best quality of life where we can as long as possible. And to do that, let's really focus on getting her down to a lean, ideal body condition so that she can be mobile as long as possible and do the things that she loves. I'd much rather have the positive conversation than the negative one. Yeah. No one you know, no one wants to go tell someone, oh, sure. you know, I'm really worried your dog is going to get worse and have a hard time getting up. And, you know, like, that's not a fun conversation. I, no, I, no, it's not I appreciate all. this perspective. I like this. So Great. motivating from here to here to action. I, I do, I do like that. Any other uh, sort of advice for, for trying to get buy-in and build momentum? Yeah, I think it's important to try to get all of the humans in the household on the same page, right? Because there's always going to be that person who maybe um, causes lack of compliance because um, they're sneaking treats or, you know, yeah. they don't see the importance of sort of the, the plan. So trying to get everybody involved in that conversation on the same page is always a good idea if you can. It's not always possible, but I think that's going to be helpful for your success long term. What does that look like when you go into the exam room? You know, because yeah. it's, it's always like, oh, my husband does. Uh -huh. He does. Well, he's not there. Yeah. You know, it's. it's yep. And so they, throw, so they throw each other under the bus. Right. Uh, that, that's that's totally true. It could 100 right. percent not. It's just because they say it's the person who's not there. It doesn't mean that really sure. is, but yeah. sure. I've had I've had like clients pull me aside, <laughs> tell me that you know, kind of tell on their spouse or their partner. Um, so I think if you can have them both in the same room, maybe you do have schedule a follow up appointment and ask yeah. if they can both be there or all be there. Um, but otherwise, I I mean, I've had clients ask me to write letters to their significant others on like letterhead to tell them they need to stop feeding the pet. Oh, I haven't had that as funny. much since I came to nutrition, but I was a, a GP for seven years before I did nutrition. So I definitely know that's so that. Oh, that's time. so funny. All right. Yeah, so I, got it. I mean, you kind of have to play it by ear, but I think trying to get buy-in from everybody is useful. Oh, I love it. I just wondered if you had some special tool, like I video myself and text it to them. I, I don't know. I don't know. I was just curious if, uh, yeah. if you had yeah. any tools for wrangling people in. Yeah, we do the best we can. But. I love it. This feels so daunting. 25 pounds is a lot. I mean, 20 pounds is, it's a lot. Um, 20 pounds for a person is a lot and a person weighs more than a hundred pounds generally. Uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's a, it's a lot to lose. Um, you know, we're talking 25%, 20, 25% of this pet's entire body weight. Mm -hmm. How do I set, it's not, it, it's not going to be done in a week. It, this is going to be a process. How do I set expectations so that yeah. the clients are not like, um, we're going to try hard for five days and then well, I don't see any changes. I'm, I'm giving up. Help, help me, help me set, help me set us up for success in mm -hmm. this, in what's going to be a marathon. Yeah. I think that's a really good, a really good question. A thing to consider. So there's a few things. First, um, the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention puts out annual reports. They do surveys of both veterinary clinics and pet owners. And on the most recent data from 2022, they reported on average maybe 30 to 40 percent of pet owners who had tried a weight loss plan either reported their pet was not successful or they even gained weight. So trying to mitigate that is going to be helpful for long-term compliance. So the first thing is being specific in your recommendations so that you are setting them up for hopefully success right away and not sort of initial lack of weight loss ribbon weight gain. We can't always prevent that. So I do warn owners like this is a process. It's going to take us a while. We might backslide occasionally, but we will hopefully be moving forward the majority of the time. I think the second thing is coming up with a timeline. So if um, Greta is 100 pounds, Let's say that she is, I don't know, 20% overweight or okay. yeah. So she'd be a, a seven out of nine, for example, if our goal is a five. So she's actually like 20 to 30% overweight as a seven out of nine. So then we can say, okay, well, she's 20 to 30% overweight and she loses on average 1% per week, which would be the bottom of our, our target range. Then it's going to take us at least 20 to 30 weeks yeah. to get her down to ideal weight. And that's, that's on an ideal sort of situation, it often takes longer. So giving them a timeline of what to expect, I think is helpful. Yeah. And then the last thing is just really monitoring. 
so that you can be making adjustments to the plan. So I normally see these patients ideally every two to three weeks, or if I'm not seeing them in person, I'm at least doing like a um, virtual check-in appointment. I'll have them weigh them on their own and send me the weight before the appointment. And then we can spend maybe five to 10 minutes on the phone or on a, on a video call and having that conversation of, you know, what's next? What adjustments do we do or not need to do? What do we need to troubleshoot? And that way we're keeping progress moving forward, hopefully, and not running into plateaus that just continue on and on and on. Yeah. Okay. I got a couple of questions. So I, I really, sure. I, I really like this. Um, so tell me what a specific recommendation sounds like when you yeah. say that, are you, how far down the rabbit hole are you going as far as the specificity of what you're giving to them? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, as a GP, was totally guilty of this. And I, I know lots of other practitioners do this too of, you know, they're overweighting and say, oh, just drop their food a quarter of a cup, right? Yeah. And we go, okay, great. <laughs> we'll see you in six months for your net set of vaccines. Have a good life, whatever. Um, and instead, what really we should be doing is giving a specific feeding amount. So the first thing is, as much as we can, getting an accurate assessment of how much the pet is currently eating. So all the food they're getting any treats, any foods that are going to use to give medications, which often clients forget to include in that history when you ask. Um, and from there, I normally would drop their intake probably 20% initially. Um, if I don't know, if they're the kind of client who says, oh, well, I feed the green bag, it's really expensive, so I know it's good quality, mm -hmm. and I just fill the bowl up every you know two days, well, then I would start for a dog with their resting energy requirement. And if they're a cat, I'd start at 80% of their resting energy requirement. Um, there's two methods. So a lot of nutritionists will use an estimated ideal weight to do those calculations. And that's great. That's how I, I did it when I ran the healthy weight clinic at K-State for that year. Um, and it's definitely a successful method. Um, that's also what AHA has in their weight management guidelines. At Davis, we do things a little bit different. We use their current weight, not an estimated ideal weight, because we want to use like a true number and not an estimate to make all of our calculations. Both methods work. Really, you're just picking a starting point. And you're adjusting from that starting point. Okay. The other thing we do is we uh, recommend that they weigh their food in grams, or if it's canned food, then at least an easy fraction of a can, because we want to be as accurate as we can, so that we can make small adjustments as we go. Okay. That yeah that that totally uh, that totally makes sense to me. I, I like the I like the timeline idea as well. I think that's part of the the recommendation. It's funny when you say you know uh, one percent per week. I go okay. Well, that's six months, which feels very different. And just saying out loud, yeah. this is minimum of six months. Just so yeah, you know, that's like best case scenario. If they're a six out of nine, I can probably get them down to ideal and figure out what it takes to keep them there in about six months. Yeah. If they're a seven or above, realistically, you're talking more like nine to 12 months or more. If yeah. they're that 11 out of nine, maybe you're talking 18 months. So it, it's not a short process. It does take a dedicated owner. And that's why you have to be their cheerleader and like yeah. positive reinforcement, right? Of the owner. You're doing a great job. I'm seeing improvement. Let's keep going. We give prizes when they reach their target weight. <laughs> what kind of What kind of prizes do you give? Uh, well, at Kansas, we took a photo of them and we had, we were going to make, this was right as I was leaving, we were going to make like a wall of fame. So I don't know okay. if that or wall of success, um, kind of like oncology departments like to do with their pets, yep. finish chemo. Yeah. And then um, I would give them like uh, slow feed bowls or leashes or, you know, Frisbees, that kind of stuff. If we had clients who were really hesitant to weigh their pet's weight or weigh their food, we actually had some gram scales and we would just give them one. Wow. <laughs> say, like, Can you please just do it? I didn't do that for everybody, but it no. was like I was getting a lot of pushback. Yeah. Well, it shows how serious you are about it. That's for sure. Yeah. Talk, talk to me a little bit about <laughs> what these, so I, I really like the sort of the monitoring part. Talk to me a little bit about what these monitoring recheck appointments look like. So you're like, yeah, we see them back two to three weeks. Um, yeah. Let's, let's first, let's talk in person, but, but I think the virtual is, is there's a lot of opportunity there, but just if, mm -hmm. if you have them sort of come back into the clinic, what, what does that recheck look like? You know, I know everybody's busy, you know what I mean? Like, um, sure, yeah. so we're trying to sort of squeeze it in. What does that experience for the clients look like? So it can be a quick appointment. So um, my sort of rule of thumb is if I've made any changes to their plan, I try to see them back in two to three weeks. If we haven't made any changes, I push it out like to three to four weeks. So on average, every three weeks or so. And it could be probably at the most a 15 minute appointment if you are sort of efficient in how you're um, mm -hmm. running it, if you're leveraging your support staff. So you could have your support staff go in and body condition that animal if you've gotten everybody well trained and on the same book in that regard, get a weight 
and take a little bit of a diet history. Like how have things been going? Are you feeding the amount we talked about last time? Have you run into challenges? What sort of troubleshooting? I mean, I think the classic example I give to students is, you know, they come in and they haven't lost any weight and it's December and you find out that, oh, the in-laws are in town visiting for the holidays and they've been feeding the dog a ton of milk bones. <laughs> so maybe we don't need to make a change that visit. Maybe we just need to send the in-laws home and get back on track. Um, but if they have kind of lost in that one to two-ish percent, percent of body weight per week, then great. We don't make any changes. We see you again in a few weeks. Reassess. If they have not lost um, as quickly as we'd like or they've gained weight, then I'd probably drop them about 10% of their daily caloric intake. Okay. If they are losing too fast, then I'd up them 10% and I'd see them again in two to three weeks and we'd reassess at that point. And I keep in mind treats. So we plan for treats in our in our plans. Yeah. Gotcha. Talk to me about what losing too fast looks like. So I guess mm. I, that's what I was going to start, start to poke you about a little bit was like, yeah. what is when they come back in in two to three weeks, what are we looking for? And I, and I definitely, I, I like the idea that we're going to, we're going to put them on a the scale. We're going to put them on the same scale they used last time. So we get some consistency. Okay. And then if we're not seeing any weight loss at all, we're going to start to adjust. And that all tracks to me. When do I have to start? worrying like oh we're falling like a stone because i suspect that yeah pet owners are probably pretty psyched they're like this is great uh we're making real headway the dog well, greta's not greta's not really she's not thrilled but the pet owners i could see them being on board what, yeah. what am i looking out for there yeah i i mean i've had that happen um it's less common than you might think but i mean i've had dogs that got boarded when they were sort of starting their plan and they lost like five six percent in a short period of time, like 10 days. Um, and so our concern there is two things. For both species, we're concerned about lack of muscle, mm -hmm. muscle losing lean muscle, right? You mentioned Greta, you were concerned about the muscle and her hind end. So that's great. I would encourage everybody to actually record a muscle condition score every visit. It doesn't have to have a number. The World's Model of Vet Association actually doesn't use a numerical scale. It's just normal or mild, moderate, or severe atrophy. Um, and then I'd also be concerned maybe in our cat patients about something like hepatic lipidosis, but that takes a lot. It takes very dramatic sort of extended okay. inappetence or hyporexia to get hepatic lipidosis. So I, I don't get too worried about it, but certainly for our cat patients, if I'm starting a new plan, I am really conscious of how I tell owners to transition them onto a new food and you know give them criteria for when they would need to call us if they're not eating the new food or they're, they're not doing well. How does the, how does the virtual check-in visit work? Because if they're not there and you don't yeah. you don't have your scale, like what is what is that experience like for the pet owner? Yeah, it, I mean it's a pretty similar, um, I think, outline to how the appointment runs. But what I do is I made a little handout for my um, owners that shows them some specific photos I want them to take. So the photo from the side, a photo from above, and then like one of their face. If you want to use the body fat index tool from Hills and University of Tennessee, I'd also take a picture from behind them, like staring at their butt. Um, and that lets me just assess roughly their body condition or their body fat index. Um, and then I have the owners weigh them and I just tell them find a consistent way to weigh them, whatever that is. If they're coming to your clinic just for a quick swing by the lobby scale or if they have a scale at home, they can get an infant scale or even like a floor scale for a big dog relatively inexpensively online. Um, and so they just email me in advance their weight. They send me their photos I can do the math that I need to do right before the appointment. And then it takes 10 minutes or less to have that conversation about, do we need to troubleshoot anything? How fast or how slow were you losing weight? And what adjustments do we need to make? Got it. Perfect. That totally makes sense. Good deal. I like this. This this seems good. Um, are there any, I'd say we've got, we've got a plan. We've got some good motivators. We've got specific recommendations. We've got a follow up plan. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I really like the ongoing monitoring. That makes a ton of sense. I 100% see how I can lean on my mom and technicians to help me with this and to run this program. And that's, that's a big deal to me. I really, I like nutrition for technicians and they can mm -hmm. make my job really easy and we can, uh, we can make a real impact together. But, uh, anyway, yeah. so I like all this. Is there any final pearls pieces that I want to make sure that I'm not forgetting? Yeah. And, and I maybe skipped over it. So in our specific recommendations, mm -hmm. the majority of these patients should be on a therapeutic, aka prescription weight loss diet. Okay. Because if we start restricting their calories, especially if we get below like RER or even 1.2 times RER, 
if we're talking about dogs, we can cause nutritional deficiencies if we feed a non-therapeutic diet for a long time because those therapeutic diets are fortified with extra protein and vitamins and minerals to account for the lower calorie intake that those pets are having. Okay. They also help them with staying full, so satiety. They, if they're canned diets, they have a lot of moisture. If they're kibble, they might be what they call air puffed, so bigger kibbles to take up more volume. Mm -hmm. And then they also often are high in fiber to help them feel full. So you really should be using a diet like that if you're going to institute a weight loss plan unless you're doing small amounts of weight loss and you're being very conservative with how fast you push them. Okay. Define RER for me real quick. Resting energy requirement. Gotcha. So, yep. Um, and there's a couple of ways you can calculate it. I'm going to give some resources, I think, at the end yeah, that sure. um, will show you how to do all the calculations and okay. kind of walk you through how to do a plan like this. Cool. I love it. And then, um, so this is, I want to dig into this a little bit because I think that's a great, I think that's a great point about moving to therapeutic diets because one of the pushbacks I always get is, well, I can just, there's a light version of what they yeah. eat, you know? Um, yeah. They're, what, we can, can I just use the light food? And, and, and I've kind of, I, I want to be supportive of pet owners and kind of meet them where they are. And at the same time, I do feel like I'm only going to get one good shot. Often it's, yeah. it's one good shot. They're going to make an attempt. And if it doesn't go anywhere, they'll, they're going to kind of say, well, I guess that's, she's just a big girl and that's what yep. she's going to be. And, and that's that. So, so yeah. break that down for me a little bit as far as where your lines are when you're like, no, it's time to go to the therapeutic diet. Yeah. And, and I just, I want to be confident when I make that recommendation to switch to a therapeutic diet and say, yes, this is the play mm -hmm. we need to make. How do you, um, yeah, where, where are your lines? Can you, can you solidify that for me a little bit? It's never wrong to pick a therapeutic diet for weight loss unless they have comorbidities that require other nutritional strategies and there is not a commercially available combination diet. So there are combination joint support and weight loss diets. There are combination hydrolyzed and weight loss diets, et cetera. So it's not wrong if you can find an option to do that other than it's more expensive. I think that's always the safe way to go. If I had a patient that did have other comorbidities, that's the time to talk to a nutritionist or at least call like the vet consult line for one of the therapeutic companies to talk to them about the case. Um, because maybe that pet really needs a home cooked diet to be able to accomplish weight loss and safely manage their disease, their other disease. But if I was going to go with a light or, you know, um, weight management diet over the counter, I'd be looking at patients that are maybe a six out of nine mm -hmm. or they have a, um, a calorie intake that's already quite high. So if they're eating 1.6, I'm talking about a dog right now, 1.6, 1.8 times their resting energy requirement, then I can probably reduce them at least for a while on their normal food and be safe. If they're starting below that, which often these obese pets are, they have slow metabolisms, most of them. So if they're starting at 1.2 or 1 times their resting energy requirement, then it's not safe because I'm going to have to be cutting them back over this like 6 to 9 to 12 month process. We're going to be making gradual reductions most likely. So we're going to reach a point where it's not safe for them to eat a regular diet over the counter. And I think that's another kind of takeaway is to talk to owners about the fact that this diet is not a short-term diet. Most of these pets have a low metabolic requirement, even once they're at ideal body condition. So they really should be on a weight loss diet long-term. I own one of these dogs. She's on a weight loss diet for life unless I have to make a switch for another reason. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. That's wonderful. Any other pearls I should uh, pick up here at the very end? I mean, I think we've talked about a lot of them. It's really about pick a starting point, monitor yeah. make adjustments, be a cheerleader. Like those are the keys that people miss and that are what actually result in, in success. And I mean, we had a roughly like a 75 to 80% success rate in the Healthy Weight Clinic at Kansas when I was there. Mm -hmm. And most of the cases that weren't successful, we had lack of compliance or we lost a follow-up. So I think if you work the plan, so to speak, you can help a lot of these pets. And there's like 60% of both dogs and cats that are overweight or obese currently. Yeah. So this is the case you see every day. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, the, the overweight Labrador people were like, oh, that's really a novel, a novel case. Yeah, and you sure. haven't seen that before. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Uh, you've given me a number of resources. I'm going to be linking like crazy in the show notes, which I always love. People love having a, a list of, of resources. Any yeah. other that you would recommend? If somebody's just like, I just, I, yeah. I love this. I, I love, yeah. uh, 
I love I love what you're talking about. Where where do you where do you refer people who are nutrition geeks? They're yeah. just like, yeah, I've give me more. A, I've got a few. So um, the first one that will really walk you through this step by step is that 2014 AHA weight management guidelines. There is a later, like an updated version, but the 2014 is where all the kind of the meat and potatoes of this topic is. Okay. Um, the World's Model Vet Association has a nutrition toolkit. So that's where you can get your body condition, your muscle condition, other resources for your um, your support staff. Pet Nutrition Alliance does have a little online calculator you can use. Um, I think they may have updated the website recently, so I'm not sure how they've changed it. Okay. Um, and then um, Hills has the Vet Academy with some um, CE type videos about weight loss. They also have the quick repo tool that can help you initially make a plan. Um, and then if you want more about the the stats from that recent annual survey, the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention website has the results of all of the surveys, but the most recent being 2022. And they've got good infographics and stuff. That's amazing. I will link up to all that stuff. Dr. Taryn Pestalozzi, thank you so much for being here. I so enjoy you. Great. Thanks. It was so so nice talking about it. This is a topic that I really like. So. Uh, well, yeah, it's yeah. it's yeah, it's obvious. That's why I had to have you. Anyway, guys, uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Take care of yourselves. And that's it, guys. That's what I got for you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Thanks so much to Taryn for being here. I love I just I really enjoy her. I, I really enjoy talking with her about weight management. It's a it's a thing that we talk about a lot, but man, when when you find someone who is really passionate about the subject and who has had a job just having these conversations. I, you know, these are important. And just because we have them a lot doesn't mean that we shouldn't take them seriously and really think about how we get better. In fact, it's the conversation we have a lot that we should really focus on because that's where we can make a real difference for the clients and the pets that we see. I mean, I don't know. It's it just, I think a lot of time in education, there's this push to, um, there's this push to find these unique things that rarely happen and to be aware of them. And that's okay. I really think that finding the things that happen commonly and deciding that we're going to be amazing at them, I think that's how we really make an impact on the world through veterinary care. Anyway, that's just how I feel. Guys, if you have not checked at the Hills Veterinary Academy, you should take a look. Go and check it out. It is their uh, it is their learning uh, library. It's their learning academy. There's so many resources there. It is a great, great, great source of knowledge on all things nutrition. I'll put links down in the show notes. Go and check it out. Thanks to Hills for making this episode possible. Guys, take care of yourselves. I'll talk to you later. <laughs>